believe it's going to be fresh breath and fresh anointing on it, but this is a word that I believe God uh, gave me just to encourage us. And again, not going to try to preach anything deep or, or, or you know, spooky or spectacular or, or theological. I just want to encourage us. Anybody ever need any encouragement? Amen. So that's what we're going to do this morning. I just want to encourage you. And I actually, I'm so proud of myself. I actually have a, a name for this teaching this morning. 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 Right? We're, we're, for grace. Grace. Make room, room, thinking grace who, grace who, grace, the grace of God, grace of God, grace TV show, I'm really good, I'm really good, I'm this one, but years ago, there was a TV show called Make Room for Daddy, anybody remember that, anybody, I, I got a couple of hands, yeah, I'm, I'm probably older than most people in this room, and that is no, that, I'm on the sixth floor, if that, if you, if you get that, if you understand what that means. But anyway, there is a TV show um, back in the day called Make Room for Daddy. It starred uh, Danny Thomas. Anybody know who? Danny? Okay. He had a daughter named Marlo Thomas. Anybody? Okay. She, she, she had a show called That Girl. Anybody remember? I've got like five people in the room that's as, as old. Everybody else is looking at me like, that what? What are you, what are you even talking about? But show called Make Room for Daddy, but I want to, you know, we've, for the last couple of years, we've been really in this whole make room theme, making room for God, and that's so powerful and so important because we have to make room. God is, if nothing else, he is a gentleman. He's almighty God, and if anybody has the the right, the privilege just to barge in and do what he's going to do, it's almighty God. But you know, he doesn't do that. We have to make room for him. We have to yield to him. He's provided all of these wonderful things, and that's what grace is. Grace is all about what God has already provided. You know, David said it like this in Psalms. He said, this is, to me, this is like the perfect picture of grace. David said, and and most of us know, Psalm 23, you have provided or prepared for me a table in the presence of my enemies. That is a picture of grace. God has already provided the table. He's laid it all out. He's, He's put everything that we will ever need in life on that table. The Bible says he's given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He has already provided for everything that we will ever need in this life. It's already on the table. And all we have to do is by faith access the grace that has already been given to us. Pastor uh, Lynette uh, encouraged us on the, those who uh, get on the, Saturday, the Sunday morning prayer call. Grace is God's step towards us. Like, I've done all of these things, I've laid them out before you, and faith is our step toward him. Amen. Faith is how we access what grace has already provided. Isn't that good? Faith is how we access what grace has already provided. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about this morning, how to access the grace of God. So turn with me to the, the, not the gospel, but the epistle of James. James chapter 4, and we're going to start reading, I believe, at verse 5, and if we can start in the New King James Version. James chapter 4, verse 5. How many, a little bit of Bible trivia, how many know that the, the book of James was not written by the apostle James? It was not. You know, when the Bible talks about Peter, James, and John, that's not the James that wrote this book. That James was martyred very early in the book of Acts. This James is actually the physical half-brother of the Lord Jesus. Did you know that? Y'all need to come to In Christ International Bible College. You need to sign up. This semester you get to learn stuff like that. This is actually Jesus' half-brother, James. He had other brothers. He had another brother named Jude, and he was the one that actually wrote the, the, um, the book of Jude, the epistle of Jude. Y'all know Jude, Jude was Jesus' half-brother too? Amen. Amen. Y'all did a little better on that one. <laughs> 
But, you know, um, I shared this last night. The, the, the book of James, I do this a lot. I'm trying to not do that so much. Um, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's my, that's my Canadian sister right there. I appreciate her. <laughs> One clap for Yana. <laughs> She's always just a half second behind everybody else, but it's okay. Um, we, we love it. So anyway, the book of James was really, James was writing to the persecuted believers. And, you know, after, um, here I go, after the believers were scattered from Jerusalem to other nations, if you read in the, er, the, the, the earlier part of the first chapter is talking about those to the brethren who are scattered abroad. He's talking about the Jewish believers who had been spread to other nations because of the persecution that was taking place in Jerusalem. Now, this is a letter of encouragement. So he's, because at one point, you'll, rec you'll remember the scripture. He said, count it all joy. Amen. When you fall into diverse temptations, different kinds of tests and trials, basically the book of James is, is, a, is an encouragement about what to do when you're going through. Amen. I've never said that before. That literally just came to me. What to do when you're going through. And he started out talking about, you know, when you're going through these tests, when you're going through these trials, one of the first things you can do is ask God for wisdom. He said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally. And this is what I love about it. He didn't just stop there. He said, but God gives to all men liberally and he doesn't upbraid. What does that mean? He doesn't scold us for not knowing what to do. Listen, say, look, they look. They look this thing for too long, thing for too long, thing for really should know what to do and know what to do and know what to do. If I'm in a situation, 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 what to do, I pray, I pray out for wisdom. He gives them, he gives them, and he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't I want to, I want to use, a, I'm from the DMV, I want to use a local term. He doesn't bust me out. <laughs> Y'all know what that means? He, do, he doesn't bust me out for not knowing. That means put you out there, put you on display, ridicule you, scold you publicly. He doesn't do that. He gives liberally. But so we get to the fourth chapter, and he's actually still talking about what to do when you're going through. So let's, let's start at verse 5. James chapter 4, verse 5. Verse five, verse five. Or do you think that you think that youth is in vain, 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 dwells in us, dwells in us, dwells jealously, jealously? He gives, he gives, he, somebody say more, say more, say more. He gives, he gives, he gives. Therefore, he said, God resists the proud, but he gives what? Grace to the humble. What does it mean to be humble? Humility is not a personality trait. It's not just something, it's not a natural disposition. You know, some people are born more extroverted and some people are born more introverted. And we tend to look at the introverts or as, you know, the naturally humble people. You can be introverted and inside you are full of pride. It has nothing to do with that. It has, you know, I've heard people, you know, like, for example, if I were, you know, standing outside outside the door after service and someone says, oh, Pastor Bill, that was an amazing word you preached this morning. You know, humility isn't like, oh, brother, no, no, that, that, that wasn't me. That was the Lord. That was the Lord. Well, it sure looked like you. It sounded like you. But if you say it was the Lord. No, humility is very simple. Humility is recognition of the fact that we need God. It's simple as that. When I humble myself, I am acknowledging, Lord, there is something that I need in my life that you have, that you are, that I don't have. And I look to you. I lean to you. I receive your strength. I receive your ability. I receive your wisdom. I receive your, your insight into this situation that I'm going through. I'm humbling myself and saying, Lord, I need your help. And to the person that humbles himself and acknowledges that they need God, what do, what do we get? Grace. Amen. Aren't you glad that grace is available? So let's let's look at that out of um, let's look at that out of the out of the Passion translation. James four, and we'll start reading again at verse five. This is 
right now, this has all been set up. This is where it's going to take off. Amen. This is where it's going to start to get start to getting good. See, I grew up in the country, and every now and then, I'll say stuff like, "This is going to start to getting good." I, it just it just comes out. Before long, I'll be fitting to do something. I, I will. I promise you, I will. James chapter four, verse five, out of the Passion Translation. Oh, this is where it, this is, it's fitting to get good, I'm telling you. Does the scripture mean nothing to you that says the spirit of God breathed into our hearts, the spirit that God breathed into our hearts is a jealous lover, is a jealous lover who intensely desires more and more of us. He intensely desires more and more of us. I want each and every one of us to think about that individually. Think about that personally. God wants to experience more and more of you. I don't know if you've ever thought about that before because, you know, thank God, you know, we have these wonderful worship songs and we say, Lord, I just want more of you. I want more of you, Lord. I want more of you. God is singing the same song. Son, I want more of you. I want more of you. Glory to God. He wants to experience you. He wants to encounter you. He, everything that he did in, in Christ, his, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, his seating at his own right hand was for one purpose, because he wanted to experience you. He wants to experience us. It says he is a jealous lover. He doesn't want anybody else to have the place in our heart and in our lives that he has. He doesn't want anybody to be even close, not even a close second. I heard a pastor put it this way one time. It's, it would be like, you know, I'm, I'm married. My wife is teaching in children's ministry right now. But if I went to my wife one day and said, honey, out of all the women that I love, I love you the most. <laughs> there, there are a couple of close seconds, but, but I love you. <laughs> but I love you. That's how we do God, honestly. That's funny, but we do. That's how we do God. Like, Lord, of all the, of all the things in my life that I love, I love you the most. My house is a close second. My, my car is, is pretty much up there, too. God is like, there's, I don't want any other gods before me. Thou shall have no other God before me. The, in other words, there, I don't even want anything in my space, nothing in, my, nothing in front of me, nothing between me and you. Are other things important? Yes. Is my wife important? Absolutely. Are my children important? Yes. But God says, I need to occupy a place in your heart and in your life that nobody else occupies and can't even be close. Hallelujah. And when that happens, look at what he says next. But he continues to pour out more and more grace upon us. Because he wants more and more of us, how does he go about getting more and more of us? By pouring out more and more grace. God experiences, he gets to encounter more and more of us by pouring out more and more, more of his grace. How does that work? How does that look? When we encounter and experience the goodness of God, it makes us, it motivates us, it stirs us to want to experience more and more of him and to give ourselves more to him. When you know somebody loves you, when you know that somebody prioritizes you, doesn't it make you want to just be with them? Doesn't it make you want, it's like, huh, what, what can I do for you? My, my daughter, when, my, my middle daughter, Virginia, um, when she was about, Four, I'm laughing because it's, it's funny, but it, it almost worked. She was about four or five years old, and I came home from work one day and came home from work. Her mom was fixing dinner, and she came to me. She didn't go to her mom. She came to me and said, Dad, can I have a Popsicle? 
I said, no, honey, mom's cooking dinner right now. You can't, you can't have a popsicle. She said, daddy, I like your necktie. <laughs> it's like, now can I have a popsicle? <laughs> I almost wanted to give it to her. I really did. I really almost, no, I did want to give it to her. But when, and I, I, and I knew she was, I knew what she was doing, but it still worked. It still worked. When, when you know that somebody's heart is towards you, it makes you want to be good to them. And here's the thing. Do we have any, anybody in here in the medical profession? Our heart has chambers in it, doesn't it? Our physical heart. How many chambers does your heart have? Four. That's what I thought. Four. Your, our physical heart has four chambers. Did you know that our spiritual heart has chambers? We have rooms in our heart and in our soul. And we have the key to those rooms to be able to lock them and unlock them. Pastor Bill, what are you talking about? Where are you going with this? There are places in our hearts that we can hide, that we can reserve, that we can keep for ourselves, saying, Lord, I will unlock this room I'll give you access to that one, but there's a room way, I'm about to date myself again, but there's a room, there's a booth in the back, in the corner, in the dark. Does anybody get that reference? I I see a couple of witnesses. There, There are deep, hidden places in the recesses of our hearts that we have to make the decision. God knows they're there. But we have to make the decision to give God access to those places. And he wants wants access so he can put us on blast. No, so he can heal those places. Everything that we expose to God, he heals it. He blesses it. He restores it. He's not asking for these places just so he can say, see, I knew it. I knew you had that place you were hiding from me. No. He's saying, give me those rooms. Give me that chamber. Give me that place that you've been hiding from me so I can heal it, so I can fill it, so I can restore it. Everything that we give to him, he takes it, he blesses it, he restores it, he brings it back to life. So I want to encourage all of us to take advantage of the grace, receive the grace. Paul said one time, I don't want to receive the grace of God in vain. This grace that's been made available to us, let's not receive it in vain. Let's enjoy and experience the full benefit of what God has made available to us. Amen. Let me read a little bit more of this. Amen. So then, surrender to God. That's what he's talking about. Especially when we're going through and don't know what to do. Surrender to God. Stand up to the devil and resist him, and he will run away from you. When we are in a place of submission to God, because it said that first, it said first, submit yourself to God. Then he said, then resist the devil and he will flee from you. He will run, he will turn and run away from you. Move your heart closer and closer to God and he will come He will come even closer to you. King James says, draw near to God. I love that about him. I love that about him. When we we find ourselves, you know, life happens to all of us. All of us experience things. All of us go through things in life. You know, I shared the last time that I ministered, I went through a, 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 a period of life and in my, in my, I went through a period of time in my life where I experienced loss after loss. My mother passed away unexpectedly, literally here one day, gone the next. The next year, my grandmother passes away. The year after that, my 20-year marriage fell apart, came to an end. The year after that, the year after that, my dad passes away. Boom, boom, th- one, after, one thing after the other. So I understand what I'm talking about. This isn't just theory to me. I have I've experienced this. When we draw, when we move closer to God, he moves closer to us. He didn't just, he didn't just, 
Send Jesus to die for us, to die for our sin, to take our place, to cause us to be born again and say, okay, you're good now. I'm going to step back. From this point on, just figure it out on your own. Work it out on your own. He wants to experience life with us. Amen. He wants us to experience life together. Turn with me real quick to Matthew chapter 11. Verse 28, we'll start out in the New King James just to familiarize ourselves with it, and then we're going to look at something that is going to bless your socks off. If, if you're wearing something that don't belong to you, pin it in real tight because this is going to bless, this is going to bless it. Amen. Make, make sure it's secure. You know, do, it, do whatever you got to do. Make sure it's tied down, but this, this is going to bless you. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 says, this is Jesus talking. Come to me. Don't you love the invitations? God is always inviting us. He's always inviting us to him. He's always inviting us to come and experience him. He said, come to me, all who labor, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you more trouble. I'm going to add to what you're already going through. No, he said, I'm going to give you rest. Verse 29, anybody could use some rest this morning? He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. And I shared this last night that word, uh, take my yoke upon you, that word yoke used to really bother me. It did. Well, I mean, as a young teenager, when I gave my life to the Lord, this is one of the first scriptures that I really started meditating on. He says, take my yoke upon you. I'm like, Lord, your yoke? And he's not talking about the, the yellow part of an egg. That's not the yoke he's talking about. I'm like, Lord, to me, a yoke represents bondage, you know, because over there in the book of Isaiah, he said, it's the anointing that will destroy the yoke, that will remove the burden and destroy the yoke. But what, what is he talking about? A yoke, does anybody know what an actual yoke is? A yoke is a piece of farm equipment. It's what they use to hook two animals up together so that they can help you to plow the field. Jesus is saying, Link up with me. That's what he's saying. Link up with me. Let you know what. Let me let me just read it. Um, let's read this out of the out of the Passion Translation. He said, "Take my yoke upon you and learn from me." I love this. Um, is it, no? I'm sorry. Go, read it out of the the um, the message. Let's read it out of the message. Matthew eleven twenty eight out of the message. Glory to God. This is, this is where you're going to need to pin your stuff down real tight. Amen. Are you tired? That's really what he's saying. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Look at the next part. Are you burned out on religion? Religion will burn you out. And you might be sitting there thinking, you're talking about religion. Isn't this church? Aren't you a pastor? Religion will burn you out. Religion is man's attempt to, to please God on his own, with his own effort. That will wear us out. When I try to be good enough for God to accept me, when I try to be good enough to be pleasing to God, that will wear me out because I will never get there in my own mind. Hallelujah. I will never be able to do enough stuff in and of my own ability to know I have gotten to the point where I please God. Jesus said, aren't you tired? Aren't you tired of trying to work this out on your own? Aren't you tired of trying to figure this out in your own wisdom? He said, aren't you burnt out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. You will recover all the things that life tries to take out of you. He said, when you get alone with me, you're going to get all of that back, all of your joy back, all of your peace, all of your strength. When, when you come to me, everything that life tries to suck out of you and drain out of you, you'll find it back when you come to me. Glory to God. He says, get away with me and you'll recover your life 
Look at this. This is where it's talking about the yoke. He says, I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. We try so hard to work for him. He never asked us to work for him. He says, work with me. Let me show you how to do it. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. We're talking about grace this morning. You know, and going back to the illustration of a yoke, what, you know, I was meditating on this this morning, and I got the image. Let's say you have two oxen that you want to yoke together to, to plow a field. One is an old, experienced oxen, and the other one is, is, what do you call a young oxen? I don't know. Oxet? I don't, I don't know. But so you have the old, experienced one, and, and that's, that, that tickled you, didn't it? <laughs> and you, you yoke it up to the young, inexperienced one, because they're yoked together, they have to work together. That young one can't just take off and run and do its own thing, go in its own direction, do what it wants to do, because the old one is, is yoked up to it. The old experienced one, I don't want to use the word old, the experienced one is say, look, youngin, watch how I do it. Walk with me. Work alongside of me. Watch how I do it, and then you'll know how to do it. That's what the Lord is saying to us this morning. Everything that you're going through, I have been with you. That, that's exactly what it looks like. Glory to God. They're yoked together. One can't take off and leave the other. They have to walk together. They have to walk at the same pace. One can't lag behind. One can't go before because they are yoked together. Jesus is saying, look, I've, I've got this yoke and I've got an empty spot right next to me. Slip into that yoke beside me and walk with me. Hallelujah. Work with me. Watch how I do it and you'll know how to do it. Everything that we experience, everything we could ever experience in this life, he has already experienced and he is one. He has figured it out. He knows exactly what to do and why does he always, did he all, even in his earth walk, how was he able to win in every situation? How did he know what to do in every situation? I will give you the key. Actually, he gave us the key. He said, I only do what I see my father do. I only say what I hear him say. If I don't see him doing it, then I'm not going to do it. It's like I am yoked up with my father. We're, we're yoked together. We're doing this thing together. If I don't see him going left, then I don't go left. If I don't see him going right, then I don't go right. We are yoked together. He's saying, hook up with me. Link up with me. Take my yoke upon you. And the good thing is, his yoke is easy. It's not burdensome. It's not wearisome. It's not ill-fitting. It's perfectly made just for us. Why? Because we are in Christ. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get ready to close, but I just want to read something to you that the, uh, I was praying one morning about, you know, just something that I was experiencing personally. And this is something the Spirit of God said to me, and I just actually wrote it down just this morning. But whenever we struggle with feelings of insecurity, depression, inadequacy, we can be sure that we are seeing ourselves separate from Jesus. We are in that moment, we are not seeing ourselves in Christ. Because if we see ourselves in Christ, we see ourselves victorious. And this isn't, this isn't theological. This isn't just some statement of faith. This is how we live. We, this is our reality. Our reality, our new reality is if any man be in Christ, he is what? Old things have passed away. All things have become new. We have entered into a... a a, a, a yoke with him. We're walking with him. We have to see ourselves as one with him. We cannot afford, if I look at myself as separate from Jesus, I'm already losing. I'm already defeated. If I see myself in Christ, united with him, 
Jesus, when, when he was, when he was uh, crucified, as far as the Father is concerned, we were crucified. Paul said it like this, we were, my old man, he wasn't talking about his father. He said, my old man, some of y'all ain't even old enough to get that. He said, my old man was crucified with Christ. He said, nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. He no longer saw himself as separate from Christ. When we are in Christ, he said, we, we are accepted in the beloved. When Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan, the Father literally introduced him. as like, this is your coming out show. This is my introduction. I'm revealing you to the world. What did he say? He said, this is my beloved son. Of all the things that he could have said, he could have said, this is the Messiah. This is the Lamb of God. This is my anointed one. This is the Old Testament prophet that was prophesied. He said, no, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus hadn't done a thing up until that point. He hadn't recorded one miracle, one healing. There was nothing that Jesus did up until that point. But the father said, this is my beloved son, and I'm well pleased in him just because he's my son. That applies to every one of us this morning. That applies to you watching by line. You are God's beloved child because you are his beloved child. We don't have to, we sang it this morning, I don't have to do anything. There's room at your table for me because I am the one you love. Hallelujah. You take me just as I am. Y'all were in the Holy Ghost when y'all chose to sing that song this morning. We are the ones he loves and, he does, and we don't have to do anything to deserve it. We didn't have to do anything to earn it. He came after us. How, how important should that make us feel? He came after us. We weren't even thinking about God. It says, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Ungodly meant we were separated from God. We didn't know about him. We didn't care about him. We weren't thinking about him, but he initiated this this love relationship because he wanted us. The Bible says we love him because what? He first loved. He came after us. He initiated this thing. He pursued us. Anybody ever been in a relationship where you were the pursued one? All the, all the, all the ladies, all the married ladies should at least uh, amen that one. Amen. Some of the brothers, too. Some of us were pursued, too. Amen. We ain't going to get into that. We ain't going to get into that. Amen. But we were the pursued one. God was the pursuer. He is the initiator. He came after us. And he thought somehow, as jacked up as we were, he thought we were worth it. And he still does. I'll never understand it, but he looked at us and said, you know what? C.C. Winans had a song out years ago that says, it ain't easy, but it's worth it. Coming after me wasn't easy. Coming after you wasn't easy. But to God, it was worth it. We were worth it. Amen. Hallelujah.